Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this month's webinar. And this one's going to be about fixing bugs. Uh, now, I'm not sure if any of you fixed bugs before. Of course you did. Uh, this is not about fixing a specific bug, but the process that we want to go through in order to achieve fixedness. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of scenarios. I'm going to talk about what bugs are. Um, it may seem like a bit basic, but if you take a, a look at it, um, it's more of a process that's a bit involved. And I want to show you that because this is something that I was to, uh, taught, sort of thought, um, very late in my developer life. And uh, I want to share it with you and I hope you enjoy it. Um, so let's see, who am I? My name is Gil, um, I'm a training and I, I'm, I'm a consultant and I work with developers, testers, everyone involved in software development wants to create better software. I'm the author of two books, Everyday Unit Testing and Everyday Spring Testing. And some of the things that we're going to talk about today uh, involves automated tests, which is not a surprise um, in, in regarding what we do. You can catch me on gilatestinggil.com, testinggil, uh, everydayunitesting.com as well. I sometimes hang around Twitter, um, as you can get me there. And the things I'm going to talk about today is about things that appear in a couple of my courses. Um, some of it is a bit new. Like I said, the things from my courses that I'm going to show here, are basic, basically it's coming from uh, a couple of things, uh, both clean code, which I've done a lot lately in different languages, Python, C++, stuff like that. And also discussing bugs there. Uh, there's also the unit testing part and the TDD part as well, uh, sort of correlate because uh, both of them are involving software development processes. And that's why there are. Yeah, so bugs. Um, I like bugs, Bunny, but that's the only sort of bugs that I do like. Um, the, the bad news from this session is that I'm not going to tell you anything that will eliminate bugs. Sorry. I am going to show you some things that can help both reduce the number of bugs when we because of the way we're thinking about bugs and hopefully not get them back at, at the end, like when they, if, if they return. So yeah, obviously it's going to be some test automation involved, but we'll get to that in a minute. Now let's start by talking about what a bug is. And I'm not talking like a specific definition of the, yeah, it's not according to requirements, but it's like, when we're looking at something and there's a gap between the expectation of the behavior we want to see and the behavior itself. So it could be something like, it's not like in the spec, but it doesn't have to be. It could be like, hmm, that's weird. If you get a feeling like that, like you expected something else, but the behavior is not completely what you um, you expected. This, this is the beginning of the bug. The, the end of the bug would be like a decision keep it like that or fix it or change it or whatever. But um, the, 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 the bug thing comes from the point when we expect something and get something else. Um, what, are, what are the reasons that we basically have bugs? So I'm going to talk about this bit. So I kind of have a couple of origin stories uh, for our villains in the story. So the first one is that, well, we miss stuff. We, we, we don't think about stuff. And I'm not just talking about developers who program the code. It could be like the product who doesn't think about everything. And it could be the architect who doesn't think about everything. It could be the designer, you guessed it. And the, and the uh, developer and the testers, all are humans. Uh, not, not everyone's like the things in the slides. So we miss stuff. We didn't think about everything. Uh, we don't plan for every eventuality because we can't think of every eventuality. So the first thing is that, yeah, we miss stuff. It's going to happen. And when we miss stuff, it's not always we miss the same stuff. 
unfortunately. And uh, therefore, at some point, we somebody else expects something that I didn't think about. It's not in there in software. Ah, there's a surprise there. The second thing, it's not about what we don't think about. It's about what we do think about, but then we have a problem with communication. So uh, when I know something and I want you, like I'm the product for, uh, this, for, for this uh, part of the session, and I want to communicate to the programmer what I want to do. So I kind of came up with a solution. I communicate. We communicate badly. So we can't really tell everything that what's in my mind. And we use words and we use pictures and we use diagrams and whatever. Not everything works exactly the same. And can tell you like something from uh, 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 a session I did just last week about uh, in clean code. And we start off with, with one code. Um, so, uh, Two people look at the same code, understood it differently. Understood what, it's, and this is like the code. It's like the, the absolute truth, right? So even if we, when we have this absolute truth, we understand not completely the same. So we have a gap. We have again a gap between what we somebody expect and something that was written in the code. Now, if we take it a bit, uh, if we take communication part a bit into uh, uh, deep into the into what we're doing it's, it's like translations right we, we when we're communicating something what do we commun communicate well we communicate behavior we communicate expectations and basically we're communicating something but is it always the same thing no because we have translation errors if you think about it even if we're doing like completely simplified process of uh, a customer wants something as a problem and the product will create, ah, this is a solution. So there's a translation there from problem to solution. And then the architect looks at the solution and says, ah, I'm going to solve it this way. Does it include everything? No, there's translation errors there as well. So on with the designer and so on with the code. There's translation errors that accumulate. And uh, these kind of translation errors find themselves as bugs at the end. So uh, it's not, we can't currently think about what we don't know, uh, what we, how, we com how we communicate stuff and how we translate stuff. Uh, there's a bit more than that. So we are not just translating solutions, we're translating models. So we have like a model of what how the solution looks like. Uh, and we kind of think about how we're doing stuff and we translate that into the code. And it kind of works, right? Ah, oh, did we translate correctly? And here's an example of when we don't translate correctly. And uh, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A box. I will try to get to them later. Uh, so again, this is one of, uh, one of the things from my uh, clean code part. Um, so one of the exercises I give is I, I'm like from clean slate, I tell the people, uh, yeah, write me a tic-tac-toe game. And they usually start with a game class, and then create a board class, something like that. And the game class creates the board class, which perfectly okay, right? It runs the code, it does the behavior that we want. But if you think about it, this kind of model doesn't happen in real life because in real life, we can play multiple games on the same board. So does it work? Yes. But once we start adding more features, we start like squeezing and stretching the code in different ways because the models are different. So if we have different models and we, the code is kind of no longer uh, translate the real model in life. That means that uh, it's going to be riskier to introduce changes into the code. It's going to be, we're going to make mistakes there. So the model translation, which is incorrect, and could be like bad thing uh, at the end, kind of creates bugs. I I'm 
kind of, um, I think that is important to say because we find code as something that we can do everything, everything in code, right? You can write whatever you want. At the end, the behavior is going to be the same. But that's true if we had like one shot. If we go back to, into the code like we do every time, then that makes every step of the way, every increment basically harder to make sure things still work because if the code is different than the, the real life or the real solution model, we kind of do the translation in our mind and we miss stuff again, kind of go back to square one. So the things like, th this is very technical stuff, right? We said that the models should look like this, should be like real life. If we don't enforce that, we kind of introduce traps for our bugs. Um, next thing is probably something that you already know because we assume we already know. Assumptions. Assumptions are basically the bane of our existence really because we don't know we are wrong because we're sure we know what we are, what we are doing. We're sure that nobody's going to send a null value in there. We're sure that nobody is going to access this API at the same time as we are. Why are we sure? Well, anything experience tells us, nobody told us, so we assumed that. Um, we didn't have any trauma in our lives because at this point, because everybody had some kind of traumatic bug and remembers what happened there and he knows to be careful there. But the assumption, we kind of build assumptions into the code. If you take, for example, uh, and another example, I gave the unit testing seminar I gave last week. Um, I was talking to the crowd the same way I'm talking to you and tell them, well, I have a calculator. And if I press two plus three equals, what do I get? And everybody says five. I said, excellent. So again, I'm pressing three plus four equals, what do I get? And everybody says seven. I said, wrong, my calculator only pres pres presents five. Said, Why is that? This, there was no spec. The assumption that what I was told them works like every calculator they met in their life. So we kind of assume stuff, not from our experience, from similar system. And we, we, we kind of write these things into the code because everything we assume, either goes like, I need to handle this, or this will never happen, and therefore I don't need to handle this. And it could be like, in the second case would be, well, I'm not handling this, no code for that. But in the first case, I'm going to write a lot of code because I'm going to make sure nothing's going to happen there. And that code may have some bugs in that as well, because it's too complex. Another example would be like um, you, you have an API and you send you you send something in the body of the API, and we assume that this I don't know the JSONs going that you're going to send is going to be in the, some kind of structure, but we don't validate that. So if it doesn't come up in that kind of structure, we're surprised, and this surprise come out as bugs. Oh, by, by the way, there's another thing. Uh, we do also mistakes, but I'm not counting that as bugs because yeah, who does? So we all, the, all these things kind of accumulate and we try to do all kinds of things to reduce this, the number of bugs. So, and, and these are not technical stuff. These are human stuff. We do design reviews and we do code reviews and we communicate and we try to enforce language and to enforce models. And the more we do that, we actually reduce the number of bugs. Because if we didn't do it, everything, everything would be uh, uh, communicated through documents. And you would sit alone in your room and all you had was these documents and you have to realize everything from that and your experience into the code. If you've worked in that kind of scenario, you know that you're kind of shooting around trying to uh, not to miss. The more we have processes in place, we kind of reduce the risk of that. So can't eliminate, but if you're doing all these kind of processes, you're in the right way because you're going to actually look at this stuff and try to reduce it. However, bugs will be there. And, and this is the, the, the part of the seminar, the, the, the webinar that I'm going to discuss of, well, what do we do when that happens? Um, because we, we want a couple of things when we're fixing bugs. First one, fix it, fix the behavior. Cool. Second thing, 
we don't want it to return. So you, you're probably guessing there's going to be a test around that. We want to make sure that the bug that we're fixing is not just a symptom. So we're going to analyze the bug and talk about, well, is this like the specific bug or like a group of bugs that are hiding there and we want to solve that as well. So, and, and for those, the brothers and sisters of the bugs, we want them not to return as well. And we want something else. That something else is uh, we don't want to break anything that worked until now. Now I'm telling you stuff you probably already know, but if you start thinking about it as a process, you'll see that the process that I'm going to describe take these things into account. Uh, so um, what am I going to do? Let me teach you. See, this cat is not surprised. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of scenarios. And I'm going to use my messy calculator to do that. If you've been to one of my earlier webinars, you maybe may have seen uh, uh, examples coming from this. It's a calculator. Um, doesn't do everything. It doesn't do everything right. And I use that a lot for refactoring and, and, uh, and teaching uh, test planning, stuff like that. To that end, today, I'm going to show you uh, how to fix bugs in it. The first scenario I'm going to show you is uh, when, we dis when the build is broken. So what does it mean when the build is broken? Ah, we have a test that catches the bug. So a test that used to work, work before uh, now breaks. What do we do? I'm going to show you uh, cl cleaning the logs because it's important for us. Triangulation, which is a fancy word for finding out what the problem is. We're actually going to fix it, ask if, if we need more tests. This is a very simple operation that we kind of do it automatically today. Uh, most of us, um, but maybe not. So uh, um, I'm going to show you a bit of code of that. So here's the code. Um, yeah, so what do we have? Well, we have an API, so I'm going to do this in Java. Everything I tell you today is not Java or Spring related uh, because we're talking about the process. Uh, so what we have, we have a controller. This controller calls, uh, has a calculator uh, in, the, in it. This is the calculator logic. Uh, controller is an API controller uh, as a calculator uh, rest endpoint. And then we have a press post method that passes the key that was pressed. And we have a get method that calls a display. That's basically that. All the logic is really here. And when I say all is some of it, it's not, it's not nice, very nice code, but that's okay. That's basically it. And now let's look at a test. The test that uh, used to work, but doesn't. This is a spring test. So this is an API test. Uh, I'm using, uh, I'm injecting the controller and tell spring to load it in mock MVC, which is like spring API unit testing. Okay, we'll discuss what it does. Uh, basically what we have is that calling press with three then calling press again with plus, and then getting the display. And then we expect it to show three because in my calculator, if you press an operation after a bramber, you, you still see the number. And then that's basically it. So this used to work. Now what happens? Well, if I run it, and I wait a bit, and I wait, I wait a bit more, always does this in a demo. So what will happen eventually, this is cool demo, all right? We'll wait, that's okay, because that's how the demos work. And once it happens, excellent. So you'll see, yeah, the test breaks, but there's a lot of junk going on in here. 
And when we're looking for failures or we want to debug, it's always nice to clean the logs. Uh, I'm using log back here. So if I can uncomment all these things here. Uh, and I'll run it again, I'll get a lot less junk as it goes. Uh, so cleaning, cleaning the logs is something that help, it is helpful always in debugging, in running tests, finding out what the problem is. A lot of, if you're running Spring applications, for example, it's going to be a lot of junk going in front of your eyes and trying to figure out what's happening. Always look, uh, look if you can clean up things. What what is the cleaning here does? Basically, it tells you that the logging mechanism that if something is happening, only notify me and write it in the log if there's an error. So yeah, cool. Next, what do we do? Well, we operate our brain. We say, well, who touched this code? If it if I know that I touched this code, that, that that's not a problem. If somebody else touch it or build breaks, that means somebody else will look at well, who touched this code? Yeah, I mean, we find out somebody touched this line. It's very easy today, right? And we say, ah, that's a minus. That should be a plus. Let's fix that. Let's run this again. And wait a bit. <laughs> And it passes. And that's basically it, right? The, the cool thing about uh, unit tests, very small tests, is that you can collect information of who touched the code, where the, where the code was touched, uh, when. Um, it could be more complex. It could be the, the more you commit code in, in very small steps, it would be easier to identify that. The more, the less you do that, like you, if you commit once a day or once a week, it will be harder to find out. And that's why we probably want small commits to work. But I'm assuming that that's the case because otherwise you probably won't have tests. And if you're running tests and small tests, you kind of encourage to do this. So that's cool. Then you ask, well, do I need other tests? Mm, probably not. The way the code works, this kind of bug is a one time around this code. We don't need to do anything else. And basically the bug is closed. Now, th this is like a very small scenario if you have tests. Question is, what happens when you don't? So a new bug appears, and this time it came from the customer or, or, or testers or something like that. We need something a bit more complex to answer what we wanted to do. And that is, remember, we want to fix the bug, we want to make sure the bug is fixed without breaking anything else. Um, and I'm going to show you something else during this process, which is called the soft squeeze, which is how to basically start from a failing test and f uh, getting to a test that is small enough to identify the bug. Because once you do that, you can fix the bug very easily. So the process is basically cleaning up the logs like before that, writing a failing test because we didn't have one before. We're going to replace the smaller uh, with it a uh, smaller test if it's possible. Find the bug before we're going to touch it. We don't want to break anything else. So we're going to write a uh, write a, character, a characterization test. Fix the bug. Refactor because we want to refactor and uh, uh, keep the code uh, better than it. We found it. Ask do we need some more tests? That's basically it. How does it look like? Okay. So yeah, that was short uh, and I'm going to uh, start here. So I'm going to start with a test. And then the test, the failing test will tell you what the bug is. Same system, different bug. And we were supplies with something we could reproduce as a test. So basically if we press X and then press three, get the display, we expect it to be three because we don't have an X button. Excellent. So we have a failing test. Now, what I want to, I'm going to start now doing is I want to get to a minimal test because this is like a test a tests the entire system, right? Spring and the APIs and the controller and the, con and the calculator itself. Now, let's suspend our uh, belief right now because we know where the problem is. It's in the logic of the calculator, but I want to go to the entire process 
And the process is called self squeeze. The self squeeze, you, you might look for it in the internet, you'll find a couple of small examples. Uh, the first one is by the person who named that. And the, the person is Kent Beck, the mighty Kent Beck. Uh, who wrote JUnit is the master of TDD. And he did not invent it, but he was shown this method by his friend. And his friend was David Saf. And um, he called it the method after it. And it's called the Saf squeeze because we're squeezing, we're going to squeeze out parts of the test uh, to be left out with the minimal test. Um, not a lot of examples there. So I thought this would be like a good, uh, good way to introduce to people something that's very interesting because what would we do if, we did, if we're not going to do that? We're going to debug, we have a test, right? Let's find out what the problem, but the system could be very complex. The idea here is to start with a failing test. And instead of using the debugger, we're going to rerun the tests, only take, uh, take parts of it every time. The way we're going to do this is called inline. If you know inlining from refactoring, just placing the code, if you're calling a method, uh, replace the calling methods with the, the correct code. Note that we're going to do this uh, it will not always work and we might need to change the code. So before I'm going to start doing inlining, I'm going to commit at this point where I have a failing test before I'm starting to do this. So I'm going to show you the steps of how to take this kind of test and make it as smaller as possible because at the end, I'm going to have a unit test and then I'm going to revert to the earlier test. So I'm I'm as you can see, from the tree here, stop it. Uh, I'm going to go through a couple of tests. So I'm starting here. The first thing I'm going to do, we said inline. Okay, so inline it could be like something automatic, but it could be like something else. So uh, I'm going to look at this. Well, what is the first step? The first thing I'm going to remove from the equation is the API call. So instead of calling the APIs, I'm going to replace this with calling the control. It's like a controller uh, unit test, not completely, because if you can see, this is a spring test. The first thing I'm going to do is take the APIs of the, uh, the equation, and I want to see if we have the same behavior. If we still have the same behavior, that means we're still capturing the bug. So I'm going to run this just to show you what happens. Wait a bit. And you see that the behavior is this, basically I'm expecting three, it was X three, and I'm trying, I'm going to start pulling things away from it. So the first step would be, instead of calling the APIs, I'm going to call the controller itself. This is still, it looks like a unit test for uh, the controller and, uh, sorry, uh, this. It's still a spring boot test. Uh, I'm embedding the calculator controller and uh, letting uh, Spring inject it and basically use it in the same configuration. So both the controller and the calculator, but I'm not calling the APIs. I'm just calling these things in. If I get the same, and the same assert, the same behavior, that means everything outside it, all the API calling doesn't help me get to the bug. So I'm going to run this, see what's happening. Obviously, same behavior, and that's cool. I have a smaller test. It's still a spring test. Now what I'm going to do is remove spring completely. So it looks like this. I'm creating the calculator controller by myself, calling press X and three, and it should be three here. There's a bug. Okay, excellent. Gonna run it. But this time it's not the same behavior. You see that if you look at it, I get a null pointer exception. So I did something wrong. What is this something wrong? Well, you can see, look at the calculator controller. You see that it expects also to be injected by the calculator. Now in regular examples, this would be private and I would change it to public. 
uh, because like I said, I'm doing some modification of the code so I couldn't line it. So if after changing that, I can write this code. This is a unit test without spring. The difference is that I'm creating the controller by myself and I'm setting the calculator uh, as a field. Now, this is a unit test, obviously. I'm gonna run it. It runs and I get the same behavior. So now I neutralized spring as something that uh, gets the bug going. Excellent, so I'm going in. What am I going to do next? Well, we know where we're going next, right? The calculator itself doesn't have a lot of things, so I can actually inline things and replace things with the calculator itself. So a unit test for the calculator, same thing, only I'm calling uh, press on the calculator and get display on the calculator itself, run it, get the same behavior. Excellent, I'm reaching in. That's cool. So I know that where the class is, which you probably knew before, but that's okay. In real big systems, it, it is a smaller steps and we're going to reach in and the process is still the same. Okay, what do we do now? Well, I said about, what, what is this squeezing in? So I'm going to show you an example. So if you look at the get display of the calculator, we'll see that basically it says if display, display equals zero, it returns zero, otherwise returns the display field. Excellent. So what I'm going to do is inline this. And the way I did this is with IntelliJ because it's smart and it created me this thing. So what is this thing doing? Basically it tells, sets something in the result. And basically if the calculator dot display, and remember, I might need to change display to be public in order to do this. Uh, so calculator display equals nothing. It will just do the result. Excellent. Inline is correct. What about this thing here? So if calculator dot display equals uh, nothing, it will do this. But I'm suspecting that it will not. Because at this point, I know my calculator. It doesn't make sense that display is nothing because if you look at the code, uh, where is it? It starts with zero, really. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come comment out these things here. Okay, I remove the condition. I also remove the zero here. And I, I want to see if the behavior stays the same. And it does. I'm still getting the same behavior. So I can remove these lines. Excellent. I'm squeezing out these kind of things. Then it occurred to me, well, Gil, you, you, you're not really thinking straight. You know, you're looking for an X and three, and then you're looking for a three. Obviously, after the X, you want the same behavior to stay. We can squeeze out these bottom parts. How do we do that? We add an assert. Now the behavior might change after that, but it still captures the bug. So I'm going to add an assert. And I'm asserting that the display at this point, I'm expecting it to be zero because it starts out as zero. And if I'm pressing something like a letter that I'm going to do, it still needs to not change. So if I run this, it fails on this assert. Okay, and that means it doesn't even get here. So the behavior might have been uh, changed, but the bug is still captured because I'm expecting the bug to be here, not at the three. So I can remove this. And what I'm finally left is, is something like this. Now I can, sorry, I've done something I shouldn't have. That's okay. Now I could continue inlining press and, uh, and uh, that's it. But uh, a look at press, you'll see that it's here, it's looking for a C and plus and stuff like that. I will be, if, if you, I did this, I will probably be remaining with nothing else. So basically what I'm tr finding here is that I'm, it's not behavior that's broken, but missing behavior. And that's okay. So, at this point, look at the, uh, what I have. I have a smaller unit test just on the calculator calling press and it uses the display. Remember the display is a field that I exposed in order to do this. So at this point I say, okay, I have a smaller test capturing the bug which is, might be easier to fix. I'm 
not throwing this away at this point, but I am reverting to what I had before. And before, remember, all I had was the API test, sorry, the API test here, which is failing. Excellent. Now, what do I do? Do I fix the bug? No, not yet. Remember, I don't have any other tests, so I want to write tests that make sure that other behavior is still correct. Now, I know most of the logic is in the calculator, so I can write unit tests for the calculator. And basically you have like, this is like a refactored test, so basically tells you that for everything at start, it's to show zero. And basically what it does, basically run, uh, capture this string and calls press on it for every character, like the calculator accepts. Uh, so these are like helper methods for the calculator unit test. And this is the behavior that I captured, which still works before I make the changes. And I want to make sure that it still works. The more I do that, I will make sure that nothing is broken as I do that. Once I have that, I can head F I can add to my unit tests the failing test from before. Notice that this time it's working with the API of the calculator, not the field. So uh, uh, pressing letter should any number should ignore the letter. Note that uh, it's not just the X thing. It's like my intent is to really uh, fix the entire bugs family. And for every letter and number should ignore the letter. So yeah, I'm, I'm writing this and this obviously, fa obviously fails. At this point, I have two failures, the unit test and the API test. So I'm going to fix it. How do I do that? Well, if you know a bit about TDD, there's something called fake it till you make it. You make the, th the things that the minimal thing just to pass the test. We know that's not the final thing. So, but at this point, I have all of my tests running, all the unit tests, meaning the failing one, the characterization test one, and the API test. Is this a good thing? No. What do we do in TDD? Well, we had a breaking test. So we're going to add another test, this time with Y, because Y will fail. And it kind of drives us toward, well, this is a way to put a generic thing here. What is the generic solution? Well, I'm using a, a regex, regular expression to do that, which you kind of notice, well, it doesn't solve everything because we have the C here, but we're taking small steps, that's okay. So if I have this and I run my unit tests, this time my unit test actually works, but the characterization tests, don't, and this is why I need characterization test to tell me if I've broken something. It wouldn't be as blatant as what I showed you here always. So you need these things to tell you if you've broken something. What do we do? We fix it again. Go to the calculator. This time I'm, it's a regular expression from A to Z and A to couple, A, A to capital B then skip C and D to the end. And now again, I'm having all my tests running. Excellent, and obviously this is not readable to humans. So I'm going to finally extract that into a method, do a bit of refactoring. If any letter except C, then return. And I can continue refactoring and I can add at this point more tests uh, around this, and uh, basically you get the idea, but I fixed the bug and, uh, and the bug family and haven't broken anything. So again, looking at the process, uh, I cleaned up the logs. Well, that was earlier, uh, but that was uh, still uh, something that I needed to do. I wrote a failing test. This is something that captures the bug. It doesn't have to be uh, at the point where I know where the bug is. So in my example, it was like an API test. Could be an end-to-end -end test, that's still okay. Um, but it captures the bugs. When we have this, I started the soft squeeze. And the soft squeeze was inlining code into the test over and over and over again. Removing stuff that is irrelevant. In my example, it was 
uh, Spring API calls, and then Spring, and then the controller itself, uh, and then parts of the calculator, and then replace that with asserts, so squeeze things out both from the top and the bottom, until I was left with a smaller test that identifies the bug. And at this point, I reverted back, added some characterization tests to make sure that the, I'm going to change the code in order to fix the bug. Whatever is still working, I still want it. And the more characterization tests I write, it will be easier to identify this if it's not so um, uh, stabs you in the eye, you're doing it wrong. You fix the bug, you refactor, you get, you're leaving the code and the tests at a better state that you left them. And then ask, do we need more tests? If you do, add more tests and so on. And that's basically it. This is how you fix bug. So what do we want? Well, bugs are going to be inevitable. Then they're going to return. We just want don't them returning in batches like this. Um, and we, the process itself, basically simple, technical, takes care of um, what we want to do. We want to fix the bug. Uh, we don't want, don't want the regression. We don't want to break anything that worked before. So we have a lot of characterization tests test to tell you that what was worked before still are working. And um, we want those to continue. Um, we want to fix the bugs as safely as possible. So characterization tests, more tests uh, help us. We want to make sure that what we fix is really fixing the bug. So the soft squeeze here helps locate the bug and we make sure we, we still have the big API test in our example, tell us that this bug is really fixed. And this kind of process and uh, kind of let goes you through, it takes you to the steps. And you, if you don't jump over that and you take very small steps, you get to fix the bug. And this bug will not return because next time you'll have a test failing in the build going back to uh, phase one of our process uh, to tell you where the problem is. And again, you say, ah, I know where it is because I touched it, I know where it is. And you fix it quickly. And if you don't have the process like adding tests at the right place, locating the bug and making sure that you have enough tests to make the changes in order not to break everything. And the more you do that, first you get better at it. And the second thing is that you kind of process uh, leaps into your mind and if you start adding more tests you understand the relationship between tests code and bugs and you, you get to be more careful so you'll do a lot less time and that's basically it that's what i wanted to show you today so first of all uh thank you for staying and uh i hope this was useful to you this is how you can contact me hey everyone if you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, share and subscribe for more. Thanks for the support and remember, live long and test.